going to talk about indexing the Ethereum mainnet, um, and I'll just dive right in, okay? In a minute, as soon as I can figure out how to do so. So mainnet Ethereum comes to perfect balance on 242,686,839 accounts every 12 seconds. Am I pointing this at something? Or? Hello. So um, this is what we think um, blockchains look like. Um, wow. Uh, and, but 12 seconds is exactly how long it took me to find a multi-thousand dollar mistake in my automated tax return that I paid $2,500 for. How many of you have had an experience similar to that? Why is that? It comes to balance on all those accounts every 12 seconds. So what we're, uh, this is really not quite how I thought it would go. This is what we actually look like to the rest of the world because we're telling them that we have perfect uh, perfect data, and the data is just crazy. So why is that? So I'm going to talk about that today. My name is Thomas Rush, and David I've already introduced. Um, I think it's because the RPC software is missing something. Um, and what the, what the RPC currently gives us is uh, raw byte data per transaction, per block. And what people actually want is what happened to my account? I want to give the RPC an account address and it returned back everything that ever happened. The reason they want to do that is because they want to know where their money is or they want to know where their state is. How did the state change in a smart contract? How did, which is, includes balances of tokens. And I think that what's missing is an index of just the idea of where addresses appear on the chain. If we had that index, I think we could answer all of these questions that we have. So um, one of the things we're writing, working on, is a, a potential addition to the RPC called get appearances in a block. And it would take a block number and it would turn, return a list of addresses, very simple, addresses, block, transaction ID. And with that list, you can build your own index if you want, or scan across the history of the chain and pull out what you want. And of course, that requires us to define what an appearance is, and we're doing that. Um, we have this tool with TrueBlocks called Shifra, and Shifra has a bunch of subcommands, one of which is scrape. And what that does, you say Shifra scrape, and it just scans each block calling this routine. And with that list, then you can build tools such as export and list, which scans the whole index that we built and delivers just a list of where to look in the chain. And now you can use those lists to query directly for transactions or directly for traces or directly for blocks if you want to analyze that. Um, now, it's all based on a technique where we say, uh, given a block, given a block, show me the unique addresses in that block. So this is what I'm talking about, I think, is missing from the RPC. And if we had it, we could get this list of uh, addresses. So... When I say an appearance, if you look at all of the Ethereum data, there's certain places where it's very obvious that it's an address, like here. That's definitely an address because in the definition of the data, it's called an address. But there's also all these other places where the data uh, has byte data. And a good portion of all the address appearances are in this byte data. So, uh, we wrote some code that looks at this kind of crazy byte data and identifies very clear places where an address appears, like there. And then there's other places where addresses appear where maybe it doesn't quite look like an address. Um, but our algorithm 
basically does this. It looks for leading zeros. And this is an artifact of solidity. The way solidity packs addresses into a, thir into a byte stream is it packs it with um, leading zeros. And this is why I call it an appearance, because this appears to be an address to me. This is pretty obviously an address. Down here, that's technically also an address, but it doesn't appear to be an address because it has too many leading zeros. So there's no way to actually create a list that's perfect. That's just not possible with a byte stream. But what you can do is better than just look at the things that you know to be addresses. And this is why I call them something different. I call them appearances. So we studied that uh, against, um, I'm calling it a Web2 API, which if you look at the first column there, you can kind of see which Web2 API we studied against. And we found consistently that that method that I just described finds about 13% more than uh, a Web2 API that we use. So if they return 100 appearances, this method finds 113 appearances. And if we look at where we found those additional appearances, it's always in that byte data, of course, because that's exactly what we do that's different. And then we said, given that there's 13% more appearances, what are those things doing? And it turns out that they're all, not all, but a, a large majority of them are financial related. And this is why I think is exactly why when I um, try to do my tax accounting, it doesn't work because they're literally missing transactions. So it's no doubt why they're incorrect. So I'm just gonna now describe what we do with these appearances um, to avoid just becoming yet another Web2 API. So this is the list of addresses that we would have found in a sequence of six or seven blocks and they're ordered by their appearance time. So this is ordered by block and transaction ID. And you can see that the addresses are jumbled. So what a regular indexer does is we simply sort. This is what an index is. You sort by the thing that you want to search on. But now we have a little bit of a problem because we've lost the ability to, we wanted to do something different than just store it in a database. We wanted to store it in a immutable storage because this data is, it's immutable to begin with and I wanted to try to preserve that immutability. And, um, and um, we ran into a problem very early because every time we add a new record to this database, we resort and we get a new IPFS hash so that we've damaged our ability to store it in an immutable way. So we did a very simple thing. We did exactly what blockchains do with transactions and blocks. We do with blocks and what I call chunks. And a chunk is basically just a whole big group of blocks that were sorted and then we say, that's enough. We're gonna stop, we're gonna create a chunk. So I'm basically creating I call it a time-ordered log of an index of a time-ordered log. And that's exactly what the blockchain does. And the reason I think the blockchain creates blocks is because it wants to create an immutable object that can be written to an immutable store. And that's exactly what we've created here. So each time we get a chunk of this data big enough, big enough in, is dependent on the chain, some chains uh, are much bigger than others, so we want bigger chunks. Uh, we can then write it to IPFS. And now we have the ability to, um, I call this whole process scraping, and I'm just gonna set that aside. A regular Web2 API takes that sorted index and delivers it to the user directly. And if you look at this relationship, this, I think, is the problem. This is the problem that I have, is if I'm the end user, I'm begging that guy to give me access to his data because he has all the data. So that to me is not permissionless. It's not reproducible. He can withhold the data. He can lie about the data. He can do all the things that we thought we were solving with blockchains. And this is how it works now, today. So I think this is a mistake. And to the extent we allow this to happen, we're making a mistake. <coughs> so we, um, say we don't want to do that. 
we want to give it directly to the end user, but this kind of has the same relationship. That didn't really work either. So we kind of set the user aside for a second. We write our data in chunks to IPFS, and we keep track of each chunk's uh, IPFS hash, and we put all of those um, IPFS hashes into what we call a manifest, and we also put that manifest on IPFS as well. So each time we get a new chunk, we have a new manifest, but, and then we're, um, but this hash represents a file that contains every hash to every other piece of the index. So with a single 32-byte hash, I can deliver to anyone who wants it, I can deliver the entire index. And as long as I'm pinning it or other people are pinning it, I'm hoping that other people will pin it as well. Um, because it's in their best interest. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, anyone can have access to this index without having to pay, without me being able to withhold it, without me being able to fake it because it's reproducible because you just run a client, you run an indexer, and you come up with the same exact result. And then we go a step further, and we, um, we publish this hash into a smart contract. And now we've made it so that not only is the data available on a worldwide basis uh, to anyone who wants it, but I can't take back its location. I can't pull it back. I'm now committed out to the world that the data is out there. And we call this whole thing the publisher. And now I want to talk about why I call this zero cost, OK? That piece of software is running on my machine that I paid $2,500 for. I'm also running a local node. IPFS is running locally on my machine that I, that I no additional cost. The scraper costs no additional cost. The initial outlay for the machine, in fact, I have a laptop where I'm running this on Sepolia, is however much that costs, but it's a one-time cost. The only cost in this entire system is publishing to the the smart contract, and I can do that to a layer two probably for 50 cents a day or something like that. So for an entire year's worth of publishing an index, I might spend $500 or something like that. And it's near zero, it's not quite zero. But this is permissionless. That's permissionless, that's permissionless. The whole thing is permissionless, so anyone can run this. Anyone can publish to this smart contract. This smart contract can count how many times it's gotten the exact same hash for the exact same blocks. And we can, as a community, we can build this thing more and more robust as more and more people produce the index. But now we get to the question of why would anyone want to produce this index? Why would anyone give this thing away for free? What's the motivation? So we all know that um, in, a, uh, in an altruistic environment, the altruist that's what, the, if there's such a word, um, stops being altruistic after a while. So that doesn't work. So what's the motivation for people to publish this? It actually lies over here at the end user. So we, we think that the end user is the ultimate motivation for why I would publish this. I don't care if anyone uses this because I want to use it to get to my end user's dollar at the end of the day. So we give the end user software. Can you see that little box there surrounding that? Um, we, we give, so my motivation for this entire part of the system is so that I can give uh, my end user who I want to get his dollars because I want to sell him software. That's my motivation. As a byproduct, any other person on the planet can look at this index, I don't care. I'm doing it because I'm motivated to get my end user's dollar. And you can be motivated for the same exact reason. So you would have your end user out here and you're collecting dollars from that end user. But we're all sharing in the distribution of the index. So we avoid that pathway to an API provider who can capture us. We don't want to be captured. We want a system that can't be captured. So now this has a lot of very interesting properties. Uh, the most, there's two that I want to talk about. One is, as an end user, 
I'm interested in address one, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to pull the parts of the history that are only for my only needed for my address. You're going to pull a completely different part of the history because that's for your address, and someone else is going to do it for some other address. And in that way, all of us start pulling our own weight. We all pull the part of the index that we need, and then this gets pinned. When you download, this piece of software pins that data locally on the end user's machine. So uh, another really interesting aspect is I'm a small user. I have 7,000 transactions. Uniswap is in every single block in the entire history of the chain. They're, they would pull down the entire index. And if they pinned it, they would be sharing the entire index as well. And I think that's exactly how it should be. Big, heavy users should be uh, pinning and sharing big portions of the index, and little users like me should share our fair share. So I think that's another really interesting thing. Um, I'm going to now move forward. This comes out to be 100 gigabytes on the end user's hard drive, which isn't great. Luckily, there's a piece of there's a data structure called a Bloom filter, which lets us shrink this 100 gigabytes down to just three gigabytes. So we put Bloom filters in front of every piece of the index, and we write that, and the user only has to download three gigabytes. So that each user has three gigabytes, and they can get to exactly the portion of the index they want. They can download that and pin it and start sharing it uh, right away. So just to get back to this, get appearances in blocks. Um, there's a number of different benefits with this. It gives us that 18 decimal place accurate thing. This is because our index is more complete than an index that doesn't look at the byte data. And remember, we're worried about this person over here who's literally losing his mind. Um, It's not only financial information that this allows us to duplicate off-chain because it's a, it's a full history. So we can duplicate every state change on any smart contract off-chain. Um, and that's why I use financial data like the balance of Ether as a stand-in for that fact that it's actually just state that I'm trying to recreate off-chain. It eliminates the need for specialized indexers for um, Web 2 based indexing solutions like APIs and uh, um, am I done? Am I over? You guys cut me off that sharp? Okay, I have a couple minutes. I, I particularly don't like the idea of a coin based indexing solution like the graph. I think that's just, to me, from the first minute, that was a bad idea. If it's successful, the price of the coin goes up, my ability to use it goes down. Bad idea. Um, this makes the node software more useful because it turns the node software, which is a really bad database, into a really good database. And if it's more useful, more people will use it simply by definition. That's what useful means. The system's purposefully and natively communal. So if you use it, you, you get this benefit where it's automatically sharded and shared out across the users. It has this weird property too, because we can find Sybils using this, because I know every transaction, if you suspect that an address is a Sybil, you know every transaction it was ever in, you automatically know every transaction that every address that was also in that same transaction, and now you can trace your way back through history. It explodes, of course, so you can't go infinitely far. But And another really interesting thing is this can be done without changing the disk requirement on the node software. This can be something we can add to the node, but we don't have to store the results in the node because the, the information is there, it's just... We need a routine to return these addresses out per block. And just like trace data is not actually stored on the node, it's generated when requested, we can do the same exact thing here. And it's already fully specified. Can I click on a link here somehow? 
there's there's a link in the uh, in the uh, presentation, and you can. Uh, oh, yeah. So it's fully specified. We did our best to try to really clearly define exactly what we did so that someone else could reproduce it because we want people to reproduce it and permissionlessly publish to that smart contract. You can go back to the presentation. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. This is my goal. That's my goal. I wanna, we're, we're not web two, can we please? Put web two aside. This doesn't work how we want it to work. It's a bad idea. We, now, the alternative, unfortunately now, is this crazy Rube Goldberg machine here. I get it. I see how crazy that looks. Much more easy if, just to do that. But if you want data that's not capturable, that's not falsifiable, that's reproducible, that's available to every human on the planet for free, that is Web3 native, then we have to try to make some hard decisions, I think. So thank you, that's my talk. Hello, okay. I think we have time for one question, if anyone has a question. Otherwise, we'll just uh, end a little bit early. One question here. Wait, do I have to answer? Okay. Hey, uh, first, uh, I really like the way you uh, arrange the chunks and put it in a manifest. Really cool solution. Uh, maybe my question is a little bit of a noob question. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's about IPFS. Uh, how do you make sure it's always available if? Because as far as I know, it's kind of ephemerate, right? E eventually, if someone is not accessing, it might be go away. And how do you make it um, fast? Uh, because IP IPFS can be really slow sometimes. Right. Um, <clears throat> I'll answer the first one first. Um, I pin it because I want my end users to have access to the data. Uh, because they need it for my applications that I'm going to try to sell them, okay? Now, I think that if there were other people doing the same thing, they would also pin it because they also want their end users to have it. And then when the end users download their portion, the end users are downloading 100 or 10 of the chunk pieces, not the whole thing, they're also pinning. So our downloader pins by default. So over time, my hope is that many, 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 many people have many copies and they're distributed all over the place. So just by using uh, your software, it's already pinning on their local machine. Yes, exactly. It's, so what I say is I want zero additional effort by the user. I want the user just to get a good experience where they get detailed information. And once it's downloaded, it's super fast. So. Once it's downloaded, it's super fast. It does take time to find it, but the more and more and more people that have it, that's exactly what IPFS does. It, it, if there's two copies, it's gonna take a while. If there's 25,000 copies, it's probably gonna be very fast. And in the meantime, we cheat with a gateway. So we, we have a pinning gateway. Uh, we're looking at Filecoin as a possible solution there as well. So yeah. Um, Long term, hopefully everybody's pinning everything because that's Web3, it's communal, that's how it should work, I think. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.